Quick disclaimer, information in this podcast is for general informational purposes only and is not intended to be treated as medical advice. Always consult with your healthcare team before making changes to your diet, lifestyle, supplementation, or medication. Carbohydrates are not the enemy. Alongside proteins and fats, carbohydrates add an abundance of fiber, beneficial polyphenols and plant compounds, along with vitamins and minerals. But not all carbs are created equal, especially when it comes to your diabetes health. Welcome to Type 2 Diabetes Talk, the place where we chat about what really works to treat type 2 diabetes and prediabetes naturally with nutrition and lifestyle. If you're looking to optimize blood sugar and A1C, lose weight, reduce medications, and improve your overall health, this is the place to be. Now, here's your host, Type 2 Diabetes Nutrition Specialist, Dr. Jetta. Hello, wonderful people, and welcome to episode 20. Episode 20. That's a nice number to achieve for the podcast, and we've covered quite a lot so far. But of course, there's no stopping because there are too many topics to cover moving forward too, which is exciting. If you have a question or topic suggestion, remember you can go over to our website at type2diabetestalk.com and leave a voice message or email. And also, I'd like to ask that you please leave a five-star rating for Type 2 Diabetes Talk on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you may listen in, because your ratings help us reach more people, so they too can experience the power of nutrition and lifestyle to change their health. And it's a really easy thing to do. You don't even have to write a review or say anything. Just check the five-star rating and you're done. So I'd really appreciate that because it's only together that we can make a big difference. Today, we're going to delve back into the topic of diet. And what I hope you take away from our chat today is a firmer understanding of the main components of our diet, the macronutrients, and the role that each of these plays in our overall health and in terms of your diabetes management. But let's start at the very beginning. What is food? Sure, we all know it's something we eat, but have you ever really stopped to ponder on this question? According to dictionary.com, food is any nourishing substance that is eaten, drunk, or otherwise taken into the body to sustain life, provide energy, promote growth. Okay, at its core, Food is any substance that provides the necessary nutrients to sustain life and promote growth. It's a blend of macronutrients and micronutrients, each serving a unique purpose in maintaining our health. In this modern era, where food has taken on numerous roles, it's more important than ever to understand food fundamentals and reasons why we need to eat. To reiterate, Food is any substance that, when consumed, provides the necessary nutrients to sustain life and promote growth. This definition helps us differentiate between real food and ultra-processed food. Real food in its most natural and unaltered form includes things like whole fruits, vegetables, nuts, meats, beans, legumes, seafood, and dairy. These foods are rich in nutrients our bodies need, and they are typically minimally processed. On the other hand, ultra-processed foods are significantly altered from their original form and often packed with sugar, low-quality plant oils, and additives and preservatives. And while they might be convenient and tasty, they generally provide energy or calories with little nutritional value. So let's talk about macronutrients to understand this better. Surprisingly, water is the most abundant macronutrient in most foods. For instance, meat is about 70% water, while fruits and vegetables can be over 90% water, highlighting that natural and wholesome foods are predominantly made up of this essential substance. In contrast, ultra-processed foods often lack 
this vital hydration component. While water is important, when we discuss macronutrients, we're usually referring to carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. These are known as macronutrients because they are considered components of our diet that we require in substantial amounts to fuel our body. Most foods actually contain more than one macronutrient. For example, most people wouldn't think lettuce contains a small amount of protein and fat. Animal-based foods like meat, fish and eggs are primarily sources of fat and protein. Dairy products combine fat, protein and a small percentage of carbohydrates in some cases. Fruits and vegetables are predominantly carbohydrates but also provide protein and small traces of fats. Nuts and seeds contain all three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins and fats. As I said, most foods contain more than one macronutrient in varying amounts, but there are a few exceptions. Oils are pure fat and provide no protein or carbohydrates, and sugar is purely carbohydrate, containing no fat or protein. So let's dig into each macronutrient to understand what they are and the role they play in the body. The first macronutrient we're going to delve into is protein. Protein is a fascinating macronutrient that is absolutely essential to our bodily functions and our overall health. At its core, protein is a family of molecules, each constructed from long chains of amino acids. Imagine these amino acids like unique beads strung together like a necklace combined into different structures to meet the body's diverse needs. Take insulin as one example. Insulin is made of 51 amino acids in two polypeptide chains joined by bridges. The fascinating part is that your chain of insulin will be slightly different collection of amino acids to someone else's because it is based on your individual DNA. Now, when we talk about something being essential in nutrition, it means that our body cannot produce it on its own. We must get it through our diet. While many substances are crucial for our body's function like cholesterol, our bodies can produce cholesterol internally, whereas essential nutrients must come from our food. And this brings us to amino acids. The debate on the total number of amino acids and those considered essential is still, quite interestingly, under debate. Depending on what literature you read, the total number of amino acids can range from 20 to 22 and the essential amino acids can range from 8 to 10. So most commonly you'll see that it's 20 amino acids with 9 essential amino acids and 11 non-essential amino acids. And it's important to note that all amino acids, regardless of their classification, are vital for our life. So the other non-essential amino acids are still important. By being non-essential, it just means that our bodies can synthesize them internally so we don't need to get them from the foods we eat. Non-essential amino acids and essential amino acids are both crucial for forming new proteins needed by the body. For example, the insulin that I just spoke about. And the point is essential nutrients we must consume whereas non-essential nutrients our body can synthesize via other nutrients or processes in the body. Discussing protein sources, you might have heard of complete and incomplete proteins. Complete proteins contain all essential amino acids and they're typically found in animal sources. On the other hand, plant-based proteins are usually incomplete, lacking one or more of the essential amino acids. A remarkable fact about protein is that the body cannot store amino acids. They must be continually consumed. And this continuous intake is critically vital because a deficiency in any one amino acid can lead to serious health issues. As we just discussed, those proteins, those amino acids, do all sorts of things. For example, they construct our insulin, the hormone that helps to regulate blood sugar. 
Unlike fats and carbohydrates, which the body can store, proteins and their amino acids must be a regular part of our diet. But what exactly does protein do in our body? Well, that's fascinating too. Proteins are incredibly important for our body and our health. During digestion, our body breaks the protein food sources we eat down into those amino acids, and then our body reconstructs it for use. Again, like that example, to create the hormone insulin that I just talked about. Proteins are essential for many different things in our body, building, maintaining and repairing all the body's tissues, including muscles, organs, skin and hair. They play roles in everything from oxygenating blood and fighting infection to digesting food. Protein is a fundamental building block of life, from structuring our bodies to facilitating countless biological processes. Proteins and their amino acids are truly indispensable. So we need good quality protein to help all of our cells and bodily processes function optimally. Are you ready to take charge of your diabetes health? Dr. Jetta's T2 diet program has been clinically proven in a randomized controlled trial to dramatically reduce A1C, weight, and medications in just 16 weeks. The T2 diet program will guide you step-by-step to discover an eating plan that feels natural and sustainable for you, and most importantly, works to get results. Learn more and join the program today at type2diabetestalk.com forward slash programs. Our next macronutrient is fats. Fats, also known as lipids, are a diverse group of organic substances that are insoluble in water. Nutritionally, we're particularly interested in two types of fats, saturated and unsaturated which includes monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Saturated fats are the most chemically stable types of fats and we know these are typically solid at room temperature, butter being a good example. Monounsaturated fats, categorised as unsaturated fats, are the second most stable type of fat. The most widely known monounsaturated fat is oleic acid found abundantly in olive oil, the benefits of which have been covered back in episode 14. Polyunsaturated fats, also categorised as unsaturated fats, refer to both omega-3 and omega-6 fats, which are essential fats, meaning they must be consumed through our diet because our body can't produce them. It's a lesser known fact that all fats and oils, regardless of their source, are a combination of saturated, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. We talked about this back in episode 14 on olive oil. We know olive oil is predominantly monounsaturated fat, but it also contains anywhere from 9 to 20% saturated fat and a smaller proportion of polyunsaturated fat. This dispels the myth that saturated fat is inherently bad and unsaturated fat is inherently good. Nature designed foods to contain a balance of all three for a reason. They each play a vital role in our health. Our body needs all types of fats, saturated, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Fats play an essential role in our bodies. First, they provide essential fatty acids which are fundamental for numerous bodily functions. They also supply fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K, which are crucial for various bodily processes. Fat is the most concentrated form of energy in our diet, supplying more than double the calories per gram compared to carbohydrates or proteins. And finally, fats certainly enhance the flavour and texture of food, making it more enjoyable and satisfying. Fats form the membranes surrounding every cell in our bodies and constitute about 60% of our brain. They play a crucial role in cushioning our vital organs and are indispensable for overall well-being. So a balanced intake of the right fat strengthens our cells while a deficiency can leave them weak and susceptible to damage. 
In our diets, it's essential to consume both omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids in a healthy ratio. However, modern diets often provide an excess of omega-6 fatty acids compared to omega-3. And this can lead to an imbalance that can increase systemic inflammation in our cells and have negative health impacts. We'll dig into that topic in future. But the point is, briefly, that you want to try to eat more omega-3 fatty acids because we do get plenty of omega-6 in regular foods. But overall, when it comes to fats, the point is, fats are not bad. All types of fats are an integral part of our diet and they are vital for maintaining optimal health. Our last macronutrient for discussion is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates or carbs, as they're often called, are a complex category that cover many different types of foods. Carbs are made up of three components, sugar, starch and fibre. Sugars are the simplest form like the sugar you eat from a chocolate bar or the glucose you get from a sweet apple. Starches are a bit more complex. Think of them as a chain of sugars, and you'll find them in foods like pasta, potatoes, and rice. Fibres are the tough guys. Quite literally, your body can't break down fibres, so they help keep your digestive system running smoothly, and there are two types of fibre, soluble and insoluble. So why do we need carbs? When you eat them, your body breaks down carbohydrate into glucose, a type of sugar that provides an energy source to the body. This is the most commonly known reason we need carbs. However, what's less commonly known is that carbohydrates are not an essential nutrient. If we don't eat carbs, we can make glucose from protein and our body can also make energy from fats. And this is quite a remarkable thing because our body was designed to have metabolic flexibility, allowing humans to survive and function even with varying intake levels of macronutrients, which is really quite fascinating. Now, you might have heard about simple and complex carbohydrates. Simple carbs like table sugar are quick energy sources that can lead to rapid spikes in blood sugar levels. On the other hand, Complex carbs found in foods like whole grains and legumes are said to be like a time-release capsule of energy, meaning they break down slower, providing a more sustained energy source over a longer period of time. While that might sound like a good thing, and it's certainly made out to sound like a good thing in status quo nutrition, it's not necessarily a good thing for optimising type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes health, and I'll get to this in just a moment. Another often discussed concept when it comes to carbohydrates is the glycemic index or GI. And the glycemic index is a measure that ranks foods on how they affect blood sugar levels. So foods with a high GI are quickly digested and absorbed, causing a rapid increase in blood sugar, while foods with a low GI have a slower digestion and absorption rate, leading to a gradual rise in blood sugar. When we consider simple and complex carbs, glycemic index proposes a sort of similar thing, the rate of absorption of carbohydrates. And while the rate of absorption of carbohydrates may have some impact, the research on things like eating complex carbs or even the glycemic index has shown little, if any, beneficial effect for those looking to improve their diabetes health. And here's why. Let's consider a whole grain, complex carbohydrate food like brown rice. Half a cup of cooked brown rice contains around 22 grams of carbohydrates and around 1.8 grams of fiber. So when we retract the fiber, which isn't digestible, you'd be left with about 20 grams of available carbohydrates that you're consuming. When looking at food labels, a lot of people with diabetes think they need to look at the sugar. If we were looking at the sugar in brown rice, you might be thinking, it's super low in sugar, only 0.34 grams. And then that might have you thinking, well, this food looks great for me. But that's not so because the 20 grams of carbohydrates converts to glucose or sugar in your bloodstream. If we were to think of this in terms of sugar, 
you'd be eating about the equivalent of five teaspoons of sugar. The glycemic index of brown rice ranges from low GI of 50 up to a high GI of 95, depending on the rice. But regardless of the glycemic index, your body will still have to deal with the 20 grams of carbohydrates. The point is, complex carbs and those low in glycemic index may absorb slower, but that doesn't take away the amount of carbohydrates a food contains. Your body will still have to deal with the carbohydrates, period. And what we just learned together here is that carbohydrates are not an essential nutrient. And the thing is, we have all gotten to a point where we do eat way too many carbs. Our modern diets have become completely unbalanced. Carbohydrates are not the enemy though. Alongside proteins and fats, carbohydrates add an abundance of fiber, beneficial polyphenols and plant compounds, along with vitamins and minerals. But not all carbs are created equal, especially when it comes to your diabetes health. Sugar, which we now find in thousands of food products, adds no nutritional value to our diet. It is 100% carbs with no other nutrition. It adds energy or calories, but is completely devoid of any other nutrients. Completely devoid. When you eat sugar, you literally are consuming completely empty calories. I want to reiterate something we covered at the beginning of our chat, and that is the definition of food. Food is any substance that provides the necessary nutrients to sustain life and promote growth. If we ate sugar and sugar alone, we would not be able to sustain life. Another example of poor quality carbohydrates is refined flour, which is present in lots of processed and packaged foods. In terms of our health, and this goes for people with or without diabetes, it's about choosing our carbohydrates wisely, favouring those that provide more bang for buck, more fibre, vitamins and minerals, and with less impact on blood sugar, which is important for everyone, but especially so for diabetes health because carbohydrates have the biggest impact on our blood sugar. So think of foods like all your non-starchy vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, tomato, cucumber, leafy greens, etc. Some fresh fruits and small amounts of slow carbs, the beans and legumes. These are all quality sources of carbohydrates that are super healthy for you and also help to optimise your blood sugar, A1C, weight, cholesterol, blood pressure and support your entire metabolism to function optimally. Compared to carbohydrates, protein has a minor effect on blood sugar. While it's possible for the body to convert protein into sugar, it's a very special nutrient the body prefers to use for other important things like building organs, hormones, immunity and the like. So again, in and of itself, protein has a minimal effect on blood sugar levels. Another great thing protein does is it helps satisfy our hunger. A little bit goes a long way when it comes to protein, whereas it can be very easy to eat large amounts of carbohydrate foods. As we established earlier, fat is a critical component of our diet. And one important thing to keep in mind is that out of all the macronutrients, carbs, protein and fat, fat is the nutrient that has the lowest impact on blood sugar and A1C. Compared to carbohydrates and even protein, it does not cause blood sugar to rise and it does not promote insulin production. And that's a good thing. That's why your diabetes diet needs to be protein rich, provides quality healthy fats in generous amounts and includes the right type of carbs in the right amounts as well. And when you get that balance right, you will see your blood sugar and your A1C levels normalize, your weight drop off, and you'll be able to reduce or stop your meds. In terms of ideal macronutrient ratios for diabetes, we recommend a maximum of 20% of total daily calories for carbs, so between 10 to 20% is great. For protein, you want to aim between 15 to 30%, although 
A higher protein intake of around 20 to 30% is even better if you can achieve it because we need protein for so many important bodily functions. And fat will make up the remaining calories. If you're eating 2,000 calories a day, carbs would range between 50 to 100 grams of carbs per day. Protein would be in the range of 75 to 150 grams per day. And fat would be in the range of 110 to 155 grams per day. And these ratios provide you with a really flexible range of intake that's sustainable as well, which is really important. Without a doubt, food is enjoyable, which is why we love to eat it. And the modern era has filled supermarket shelves with highly palatable foods that we love to eat even more. But the reality is many of these man-made foods are ultra-processed foods filled with sugar, refined flours, low-quality vegetable oils, additives and preservatives. They don't add a lot of value to your eating plan. The key is to choose quality foods that do support your body to function optimally. If you need help and support with your diabetes eating plan, the right resources and support to reduce A1C weight and meds, then head down to our website and check out our amazing programs and services. We've been supporting people with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes for the past decade and our programs and services are affordable and will completely change your life, as clearly in Episode 7, Wilma shared before. In this chat today, we've covered the importance of quality protein, fat and carbohydrate and the reasons why we need these foods, and that is to obtain their nutrition. That's what helps our metabolism and all the functions of our body operate, seemingly on autopilot. And as I've said many times before, when we choose real food in its most natural and unaltered form, including things like whole fruits, vegetables, nuts, meats, seafood and dairy, we can support our body to function optimally. The distinction between nourishing real food and nutrient-poor ultra-processed food is crucial in making choices. Just remember, every time you eat, you have an incredible opportunity to fuel your body and your life. Until next week, Dr. Jeddah, over and out. Thanks for tuning in to Type 2 Diabetes Talk. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform. And for episode replays, episode notes, and more, visit type2diabetestalk.com. New episodes are available Tuesdays, 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, or your time zone equivalent. Thanks again. We're truly grateful to be a part of your life and help make a real difference.